Before we start, do you guys have any questions on the game? We had finished. <clears throat> we had finished uh, red blood cells. And now we're getting ready to go on to white blood cells. And then, then after that, we'll do platelets and we should be done with this chapter. You guys can hear me? Just a shake your head. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. All right. Back to the. So, white blood cells. Um, I might direct you to that, that screen. Okay. Because I, I don't think I'm not pulling it up or something. Should. Or, or if you want to sit on this side, then you'll be able to. I'm sorry, I don't know what. I'll keep trying to get it up on this. Um. So these are white blood cells in front of you. They, uh, unlike red blood cells, they do have a nucleus. At one time, at one time we used to look at them and like we would look at them under a microscope. And that's why it was important to kind of know the nucleus. But like if you look at this one here, this neutrophil, it looks like there's like one, two, three, four different nuclei inside of it, but it's just one. So all of these have one nucleus, they're just shaped weird, they're not like circles. So, um, are you good without the, like, without the mask? Mm -hmm. You're okay? Huh? Vaccinated? Uh, you vaccinated? I'll, I'll, I'll stay with you. Okay. Um, so, I don't really care about granular and agranular, so don't worry about that as far as what you need to know. Don't worry about granular or, or agranular. That used to be a thing, and it's no longer a thing, so you're never going to really come across it. To be honest, you're never going to have to look at these. We just, you can take someone's blood and, and stick it into a machine, and it does a complete blood cell count. And those days of looking in a slide, those days are over. So uh, I don't, you don't actually have to know what they look like. Uh, I, I wish we had lab, like an actual lab, because we could really take some of our blood and stain it. And you could see some of these cells. You could see, like, neutrophils are something that often appear in blood and lymphocytes. And you see, I've already got a mark. Some of you have already written these notes down. You're right to do so. So high levels of these white blood cells are often indications of certain problems. And low levels also indicate some problems. But I didn't put any of the low levels. I just put the high levels. So the names of these actually, they're nothing more than how they stain. So acenophils, they stain with like this thing called, this is just FYI, they, they stain with something called eosin, and um, that tends to stain things that are kind of like acidic. So acenophils, not that this matters for anything, but acenophils tend to have like a lower pH, whereas um, basophils right next to it, those tend to have a basic pH and they stain different. So it's like these are kind of like acidic and basic. They stain, like acidic stain more red, 
like this is not really showing it, but really like it's a, it's more of a reddish looking cell, and this stains like more of a bluish looking thing. And then neutrophil, it doesn't stain either. It's, it's like it's neutral. That's all FYI. What you need to know is what I wrote in black. Oh, no one's in here. You're fine. <laughs> I have been seeing Oh, they, yeah, they can see that board. Some of them might be able to see the board. Um, they stain. Uh, you need to know what's in black. You need to know what's in um, green. So the, the the main ones that you would cut, the ones that you find the most in blood are neutrophils, which are high in bacterial infections, and lymphocytes. Don't worry about it saying small lymphocyte. That's kind of stupid. Just lymphocytes. They stain. Uh, I'm sorry. They're found typically in blood as well. You find those in higher amounts than expected with viral infections. So neutrophils and lymphocytes, those are kind of common ones that you see in blood. Um, the other three, you tend not to see as often, but, but actually bacterial infections and viral infections are, are the, the largest types of infections. If you're gonna be infected with something, like 95% of the time, it's bacterial or viral. Not to say that we don't get infected by things like a fungus. We do, but it's it's not as common. So, so xenophils are parasitic infections, like let's say worms. There's lots of nematode worms that, you know, brown worms that we'll get infected with, especially as kids or if you're coming from overseas. Um, Basophils tend to be um, higher in cancer. Um, you find it in hypothyroid um, allergies. Actually, you would tend to find high levels of these. Um, and then, you know, neutrophil is bacterial infections, lymphocytes, viral, monocytes, fungal, and then that other word is tuberculosis, which is TB is actually a bacteria, but for some reason. It makes monocytes uh, show up more. Right? We have these. All of five of these are in our blood. So if you're going to do, if, if someone's going to do like a CBC, complete blood cell, then they're going to find they're going to find all of these. It's just that you expect certain levels, right? So a high level of something in the lab, then you're going to suspect one of these like disorders. Sometimes it matters, right? Because uh, bacterial things you can treat with with antibiotics. Viral, the vast majority of the time, you can't do anything about it. Go home. Uh, then you expect to find a certain number of, of white blood cells per per, um, per deciliter. It's all behind you. I'm sorry. I can't. How to get it on this TV today. So, you have about five to ten thousand white blood cells, and then leukocytosis means like a lot more than normal, and leukopenia means uh, penia. Penia is going to mean like less, a lot less of something. So, like sarcopenia would mean like less muscle. So, when you see the word. P-E-N-I-A, it means like less. But you see both of the words have blue go in it, meaning white. So I would like you to know just simply what a high level of each of these cells uh, indicate. So you'll need to know how to spell a xenophil and basophil and neutrophil. Those all end with fill. Fill meaning fill it, to like. So fill means to like something. Um, like a pedophile. It's a, it's a totally weird thing to say, but then you'll remember the ending of these words. Hold on, I gotta let somebody think. Right. 
I hope they will back. Any questions on white blood cells? That's it, the white blood cells. So that's a pretty, you know, if I ask you to list the white blood cells and what high concentrations would mean, um, it's just that simple. And again, forget about the granular and a granular. You don't need to know that. At one time when we used to look at these things in blood, those two on the bottom looked grainy. That's it. They look, they just, I'm sorry, on top, they looked grainy. And the ones on the bottom didn't look grainy. That's it. So that's, that's, that's why we call them that. We used to have to take a drop of blood and put it on this special slide called a hemocytometer. And it has like a bunch of microscopic boxes. And then you pick some boxes and you count the number of cells in each box. And you can get kind of an estimate. That's like the old way, like going back to maybe like the, the 90s. Or in Louisiana, the 2000s. Oh, shoot. Oh, four. Yes. So for testing purposes, Yes. We just need to know what the white blood cell is and what, if it's increased, what does it mean? Like, what does it, like you'll have, say like for eosinophil, it means parasitic or monocytic yes. fungal, okay. Exactly. That's it. Okay. All right, so... Before we get to this one, um, <clears throat> this is actually talking about two things. So we have um, we have ways to control blood loss. So there's there's two ways to control blood loss. Um, one is a platelet plug, and then the other is clotting. Platelet plug and clotting. So, um, a platelet plug is just like little things. Like if you get like like average cuts, if you get a pinprick, if you cut your finger on something, that's a platelet plug, right? That after after a few minutes, right, the bleeding stops. Right, a clot is much more serious. A clot is designed for some serious, serious blood loss that's going to harm you. Because blood clots are, you know, if you're gonna make blood clots, there's like a level of danger in that. Because that blood clot could, maybe you don't get it dissolved like you should. Maybe it's gonna go stick somewhere else that you don't want it to be, right? So, so you can, I envision it like this, a platelet, a, a platelet plug, is normal to control normal bleeding. And for really serious issues, your body can start taking a platelet plug and start converting it into a clot, or, or we call it an embolus. Right, so let's talk about platelet plugs first, and then we'll talk about um, um, clotting or coagulation. So, platelet plug, you see where I circled one, two, and three? I don't actually care. I don't actually care about that. Um, I just want you to know how it works. And it's not its not so difficult. I made it difficult with this slide. Um, it's not actually a difficult process. Um, <clears throat> so what's happening is, all right, so look up here at these platelets, right? They're, they're brown, they're nice and brown, right? And then if you look at them on the second slide, you see they're not round anymore, they change their shape. They, they, they look more square looking and they they start making these projections here and they get sticky. So this is like normal and what happened is that, so this is like a capillary let's say, right? And then these are, we call it endothelium. These are epithelial cells, but since they're in a blood vessel we call it endothelium. Right, so these are endothelial cells or epithelial cells. 
right? And they got damaged. And so I don't know if you've ever seen like where they're tearing apart a a building, like where the cement gets broken up by the machine. You could see like the metal sticking out of the cement. That's collagen. The metal in the cement is collagen fibers. That's like our body's version of that. So when you break away something, these collagen fibers pop out and they get exposed. And that's what's happened here. So when there's some kind of damage to the endothelium, there's collagen fibers that get exposed. Here. These platelets, so you see they're starting to, they're starting to uh, come around this area. And then they're going to start changing their shape. And they make, so they're, they're changing their shape and there's chemicals, there's three chemicals that are involved in this. And I've written it down here, but I've made it kind of confusing. So the first chemical that I'd like you to know about is ADP. It's like the same ADP that we found, that we had with like that whole ATP thing. You know, ATP is made from ADP and a P. So anyway. ADP. What does ADP do? I wrote it down here in the in the bottom, right here. ADP makes platelets nearby sticky. There is another chemical that makes platelets sticky, just like ADP. It's called thromboxane A2. And I know I didn't spell it here. I was being lazy, but I guess you know what. Go ahead and put. THA2. But the T stands for, uh, well, thromboxane, it's, it's, I'm going to spell just the first part of it, T-H-R-O-M-E. That section of word has something to do with stopping blood loss. Like thrombocytes, for example, are the names of platelets, right? So it's like the same, the same word, from Thromboxane A2. It, thromboxane A2, it does two things. One, it makes platelets sticky. You know, it makes them sticky. In other words, it activates other platelets. That's what I'm saying. So I've written two things here. I said, makes nearby platelets sticky. And I'm saying here, activates other platelets. Like, it's, that's like the same thing. So ADP makes other platelets sticky, aka activates them. Thromboxane A2, or you could put THA2, it does the same thing. Same thing as ADP. Thromboxane A2, as I wrote down here, is also a vasoconstrictor. So thromboxane A2 has two jobs. It constricts blood vessels. Not all blood vessels. You're constricting the blood vessel right before the leak. You've got a hole in one of your blood vessels and blood is leaking out. You constrict it right before that, sometime before that, so that it slows the blood flow. Right? So we're not talking about constricting your blood vessels everywhere. And then serotonin. Serotonin is a vasoconstrictor. You've heard of serotonin before. It, it has many jobs, right? So it helps you sleep and it's a mood stabilizer and some other things, right? But here, in this capacity, serotonin will constrict the blood vessel right before the blood loss. As far as you knowing platelet adhesion and platelet release reaction, I don't care about the, those names. You just need to know what chemicals are involved and what's happening. What's happening is that they're plugging the hole. They're changing their shape. They're becoming sticky. They're all coming together to plug the hole. That's it. So we call that a platelet plug.
clog blood thinners. This is a problem, right? They can't do this process. Someone on Coumadin or something, they're not heparin or whatever, they're not, they're not doing this. That's what it does. It, it thins out your platelets. So, so they will often not be able to, to do this. But these platelets, you don't want these platelets even playing around like they're going to stick together where you have a like a heart capillary with with plaque in it. Right? It's already a narrow, you know, like the road already has, like the, the street already has two cars parked on it. You can barely get your car through. Right? So you don't you don't need to play around at that point. So a lot of people are on blood thinners. Uh, this is a, all right, so that's a platelet. I'm just showing you this. That's a platelet. This is a fibrin thread. These fibrin threads, this is going to form a clot. So at the end of the clot, you end up with these threads of fibrin. And fibrin makes like a net. So these fibrin threads are going to make like a net or a web or something. And they're going to catch, they're going to catch platelets, they're going to catch red blood cells white blood cells, all of these are going to get caught in this net and it forms a big clot. It's got a process. And what I kind of did wrong here is that I X'd out an important part of all these factors. But since I X'd it out, I'm going to leave it out, which is kind of lucky for you. So, this is making a clot, and so um, the part I asked out is tissue factors, like factor 10 and stuff like that. You should probably know it, but it all ends with that word prothrombinase. So that's where we're going to start it. So prothrombinase is right about here. So when you need to make a clot, we are going to make prothrombinase. Now I've already written what prothrombinase does in green here. Prothrombinase turns, well actually before we even get to that, Prothrombinase turns something called prothrombin into thrombin. Hold on, I'm going to come right back to this. Are you guys able to see the, like, are you able to see me on the, like, the whiteboard as, like, a secondary photo? I'm asking those. The chart, but I just I don't see you. Yeah, that's all you see, right? Like, there's no way to see anything else, like in the corner. No. Okay, that's all right. So let me move away from this for a second, and let me see if I can get the whiteboard up. So I can write this out. It might be better if I write this out. Um, can you see the whiteboard now? Or do you see each other? Yeah. I see each other right now. Each other. All right. Um, okay, I see the whiteboard. All right, if you guys could just maybe pin me. Is that backwards? No, it's not backwards. Okay, okay so I'm just going to write this one out because the words aren't really on the. Um, on the slide. So we're going to end up with, when we make a clot, we're going to start with prothrombinase. Prothrombinase is going to convert this enzyme we have in us called prothrombin to thrombin. That's what prothrombinase does. It converts prothrombin to thrombin. 
There we go. So we have this in our blood. We just need to convert it to that. We're not going to do that until prothrombinase is made. Our body will not make prothrombinase until there's something serious enough that we need to make a like a clot. Thrombin is going to turn around and convert the fibrinogen that's in our blood. Remember, fibrinogen is one of the plasma proteins. So it's two conversions. Prothrombinase is going to convert prothrombin to thrombin. That's one conversion. Then thrombin is going to turn around and do that conversion. You've got two different conversions. So prothrombinase converts prothrombin to thrombin. Thrombin converts fibrinogen to fibrin. Fibrin is the threads. Fibrin is the clot. So bad. So there's like two conversions there because it's like a big deal. When your body makes a clot, it's not, it's a serious issue. Kind of the only thing that will break it up is something called plasma. Let me go back to the slide. You'll see my slide right now, right? You see, I wrote plasmid dissolves fibrin. So when you have these, you know, someone that has this having like a stroke, you give them fibrinolytic agents, give them things to break up the fibrin. So they're related to plasmid. So plasmid will dissolve the clot, that's what we hope. People that are in hospitals for a long time, like when, you, when you're not moving around, this, this is the thing behind my, you've heard of like deep vein thrombosis, right? Thrombosis, thrombo means like the clot, right? So when you don't move for a long time and your body and your blood is not flowing like it should, sometimes they can clot up, right? And then and we'll, we'll follow this the next chapter, but the danger is that, you know, the clot will, uh, it'll lodge in a smaller vessel. Like it could lodge in your lungs or it could lodge in your head. Cause a stroke or cause something called a pulmonary embolism. So, like, and so people that are in hospitals, like, like in, in long term in the hospital, they'll often start throwing clots when they shouldn't. Being in a hospital is, uh, being in a hospital is not always healthy. I'm not saying don't go to a hospital, I'm saying sometimes people get worse by virtue of being in the hospital. Catch you catch pneumonia, you, you you just start getting worse, right? You have to be there because you gotta fix whatever's wrong, but you start getting these other things. You often see that with people. Really, if if people's family knew what was best for them, they would they would 
try to get them out as soon as like they're able. Like if you can provide care at home, have like hospice for somebody come in, or some kind of nurse come in, that's always that's always better. I don't know, but people don't people try to keep them in there. I don't know why, because we feel guilty or something. Like we weren't there for our parents, but now we're gonna be at the end. But you're doing exactly what they don't want. Um, this is the last part of blood. And I'm sorry, I, I couldn't get this one working, so I just put it up here. Can you see that board too, the TV? Oh. So there's different kinds of <clears throat> blood types, and you probably probably know this already, but there's there's um so there's two different issues. One, I mean, there's two different things. One is like A and B. And then another thing is the positive and negative, so we'll get to that in a second. But so all your blood cells in your body have these markers on them that are very particular markers saying that they belong to you. The difference is red blood cells don't have these very particular markers, right? But if you're looking at like the cells on your liver, those cells have little antigens saying, you know, this cell belongs to Klaus. So no other cell, I can't take another liver cell and put it in my body because it doesn't have that particular name tag. But, but uh, red blood cells are different. They have just two possibilities, well, two types. There's a type A name tag and a, and a type B. So you can have A, you can have a B name tag, you can be wearing both of them, or you could have no name tags, no antigens. So when you have no antigens, you're type O. If you have A, you're type A, B, you're type B. If you have both of them, you're AB, and if you have nothing, you're type O. So how immunity works is you don't want to introduce a foreign antigen. You don't want a name tag. I feel like name tags. You don't want a name tag coming in the body that that the body hasn't seen. So if you're type A and you get type B, that's something different. That's so that's not a that can't happen. If you're type A and you were to get A B blood, well the A and the A match up with it. But the B doesn't match up. You're still introducing something that's that's new. But you notice under type O, I put universal donor. Because they don't have anything on there. So you're not introducing something foreign. Because there's nothing marking you. So type O can be given to anybody because it doesn't, it's not, there's nothing on it. So the body's not going to recognize it as being something unusual. So really, like, there's proteins on these things. Like, so type A has, like, the A protein. Anyway, so type AB is the universal recipient. Like, type AB blood can get blood from anyone else. To be really particular, I mean, to be more particular, it's type AB positive. Because there's another protein called an RH factor. And either you have it or you don't have it. If you have the RH, you're positive. If you don't have it, you're negative. Negative can give to positive. Positive cannot give to negative. So if you're negative, you have nothing there. So that's fine. So, AB positive is actually the universal recipient. AB positive can get blood from absolutely everybody else. Whatever kind of blood you give to it, nothing's new. AB positive has seen all of it. The worst type of blood to have if you're in a car accident is O negative. You have nothing on your blood cells. 
That means you cannot get blood from anyone else except for another O negative. Everything's going to be formed. Even O positive. O positive is going to be formed. Your body's going to attack it. The O negative is a universal donor because it doesn't matter whose blood you give O negative to, it's going to work. AB positive is a universal recipient. It has everything on it. it. Doesn't matter what kind of blood it gets, it's fine. AB positive, it can only give to AB positive. So, not very popular at the blood bank, but if you get in a car accident, that's the kind of blood to have. So there's two things, there's the A and the B, and then there's the RH factor, which is either you have it or you don't have it. <clears throat> This is called, this is my very last slide, this is called the hemolytic, I put cell, blood cell bursting, but the other word's hemolytic, right? That means blood cell. So hemolytic disease of the newborn. What happens is that, let's just talk about the first baby, mother's negative, so RH negative. So we're not talking about like necessarily A, B, A, B, any of that, we're talking about the RH. Negative or positive. Mother's negative, father's positive. That means that there's a chance that that baby's going to be positive. So now as a mother, your negative blood type, your baby has positive blood type. In the placenta, like in the womb, it's okay because you keep a separation from the baby. But as the baby's being born, then you get exposed to the positive, to the RH positive of the first baby. And now you have exposure, and now your body's going to start to make antibodies. So if that happens a second time, then now you have the antibodies, so you'll start, you'll, you know, that, that pregnancy would, would end. That would be a miscarriage. But what they do now is that they, they they give you program or something like that. I think they tell, I mean if you're if you're negative, I I don't even think they talk about it anymore. If you're if you're if your blood type's negative, they give it to you. If your blood type's positive, it doesn't matter what the father is. So it's the second pregnancy. That's the risk. Remember, it's all about exposure. You don't, your immune system, you have to trigger your immune system, and it's not right away. It's not why you're giving birth. Your immune system is going to go after the baby. It's, that's not enough time. You need to trigger the immune system. You got to give it some time. By the time your body starts to develop a, a response, it's, the baby's already out. It's going to take days to develop a response, right? So the first baby's fine, it's the second baby. But this is not so much an issue nowadays because, you know, we, we give, we have medicine for it. <clears throat> it's really interesting when you think about it. How many people do you know in your life that had to have a C-section? Right, you know somebody probably. Me. Yeah, I mean, what would happen if you didn't have that? What if the technology didn't exist and you were just 200 years ago? Like tough shit, like hope it works out. Hope the head's not too big for your pelvis. Or, or, or what if we didn't have like these like this medicine, right? This, the, all these pregnancies end up being this kid. I always wonder, like, what? Well, I, I think what happened with families like 200 years ago is that you just have a lot of kids, and you know they're not all the me. So you might be pregnant five times, and you're like, oh, three of those work. That's good. 
I don't know. I don't know how. I always like think about that. Like we have these, so many people get C sections nowadays. What would happen if we didn't have that? I know a lot of the C sections are like BS. Not a lot, but some. But a lot of those C sections because we have to have it, right? The cephalo pelvic view. That's weird. What would you? Do? Imagine you had a kid with like this huge head, and the doctor's like, yeah, we're looking at this x-ray, man. This kid's got like a monster head, this mega cranium. Man, sucks to be you. You've got this tiny pelvis. I don't know. We'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens in six months. And then you're like six months, you're like, shit, this thing's going to kill me. That's how people live. So, all right, so this is the end of this. Um, <clears throat> this is the end of uh, blood, and now we're gonna move on to the heart. So, there's essentially three three things that are in your blood. There's red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So I can get a question each on that. I can ask a question about red blood cells. And ask a question about white blood cells, and I can ask a question about platelets. My red blood cell question is going to be <laughs> wait. Oh, I don't have the same. Oh, I didn't make that nice slot. My red blood cell question is here. I made a there is a separate video that talks about. I think I, I titled the fate of red blood cells or the fate of erythrocytes. I put it up there. So if you go under modules and you go to quiz two, there's a video that's just on this. But last class, I, I the last lecture, there's a, there's an easy slide, well, an easier slide that I made that explains all of this because this is this is too much going on, I think, for you guys. And look what I did to somebody, right, to another class, right? This was already complicated. I come in here and I'm like, oh, you know what this thing needs? It yeah, needs more it. lines and more, more words. That will make it a lot simpler. If I come in and draw a bunch more words and put some more arrows around here. That's just what I do sometimes. Like, I'm not thinking about you guys. I'm thinking about how to explain this in my head. This was a stupid idea. <laughs> and you know, when I gave, when I originally did this, I didn't give them like a slide or anything. I, I showed up with this thing and I started drawing all over it. And I'm like, okay, that's your test question. That's stupid. So anyway, the, the, obviously this slide's not working, but I made another slide that explains it. That's a test question. The fate of red blood cells. What happened to them when they died? They only live 120 days, and 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 their their phagocytes by the liver and the spleen. The liver and the spleen eat the whole red blood cells. That's what phagocytes means, like a phagocyte. It, it, the phagocytes are cells that eat. Phago means eat. Site means cell. Everything's on that um, module. Yeah, everything's on there. Okay. And, and so, like, I explained it in the lecture, the last lecture, and I put a separate little PowerPoint, I mean, a little uh, video up, probably like seven minutes or something, where I just explained this one question. So, make sure you know that one. Um, let me move back one. Well, no, no, let me say it again. I keep my train of thought. This one, white blood cells. So you should you need to know what leukopenia is in leukocytosis, and you know the <clears throat> you know what this means from that. The alligator's mouth always eats the I don't know what it is. Yeah, I don't even know the alligator's mouth rule anymore. The alligator's mouth eats the smaller thing, eats the bigger thing, whatever. You know what these are. More than 10,000 
leukocytosis, leuko white cytocell, osis substitute, leuko white anemia, like less than, not a, not enough. So for, um, so for the random cells, we just have to know the fate of um, like the live 120 days and that they are phagocytes by the liver and the spleen. Yeah. Well, the fate of the red blood cells, that whole thing, and then question number two is like high levels, like name, name the white blood cells and tell me about what the high levels of them indicate. So high level of lymphocytes, viral infection. High level of xenophils, parasitic infection. Okay. So it sucks you gotta learn new words, but the words you're gonna see again, I promise. And, um, <coughs> But it's an easy slide because this is the this, this is the slide. I'm going to make the test question after this slide. Okay. Just memorize it on this slide. You're good. Don't worry about granular. Don't worry about a granular. I don't care. <clears throat> question number three. Um, I'll probably I might ask about platelet bloods and clotting in the same question. For platelet plugs, you're just saying that the platelets are going to get together. You know, whenever there's like a damage to the blood vessel, the platelets get together and they get all sticky and they plug up the hole. You wrote that, that's good. The platelets plug up the hole. They get sticky and they plug the hole up. The other part of this I want you to know, when I read the answer, your answer, I'm scanning for these three chemicals. ATP. Bromoxane 2 and serotonin. There's three chemicals. So that says platelets. Oh, yeah, you want me? Yeah, I should. I'm going to write this on the board and then I'm going to let you guys see the board. It's probably going to write over here. I'm writing it on the board and then I'm going to So for boxing, A2 again and serotonin are vasoconstrictors. You guys see the whiteboard? Yes. So over here on whatever side, I'm writing that this is with platelets. ABP and Fromboxane A2 make platelets sticky. Fromboxane A2, I abbreviated it here. Fromboxane A2 and serotonin are vasoconstrictors. And then, of course, with clotting, it's all written down there also. So what I have on the board probably covers <coughs> um, covers this question. So that's three questions so far. Question number four is the last thing we just talked about, like blood typing. And the hemolytic disease of the newborn. You should just be able to like write it out, like what is it? And you just say something in your own words. The, the, the father's RH positive and the mother's negative. The first baby being born, that's exposure for the mother. The second pregnancy, the mother's antibodies will attack 
the, the embryo. And that's all if it happens again. Gonna have that's four questions. I got one more. My last question is on the uh, plasma proteins. There are three plasma proteins. Is it one, of them, one of them is already on the board. One of the three plasma proteins is on the board already. The fibrogen. You guys know which one it is? Which word? Yeah, fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is one of the plasma proteins. So fibrinogen is going to be for clotting. The other one, albumin. It's transport, right? Transport. What's the other one? Third Globulin. one. Globulins. So that's going to be involved in your immune system. Immune. So that's five questions. That's pretty much, that's almost pretty much the that's all the, those five questions are, are the five questions from the chapter on blood. The only thing that is left over from the endocrine system is, I'm gonna erase this now. The only thing left over from the endocrine system is the part on um, PTH and, and calcitonin. Well, I so those there's five we have we got five questions from all that. Question um question six in your test bank, the whole thing with um PTH versus calcitonin. Calcitonin does something. Lowers blood calcium. PTH raises blood calcium. And that's all. That's all. The last lecture. You just have to remember how, like pulling calcium out of bone or not. When you go to the last lecture, you'll see that I talked about osteocytes. I talked about vitamin D, and I talked about calcium absorption. That is number six, and then I'm not going to pick, I'm only going to pick five of these, five of the seven that I'm giving you here. The um, what are the hormones of the pancreas? There's four of them. And what do they do? So, what does insulin do? What is what does um, glucagon do? Don't forget the other two. What does somatostatin do? And what does pancreatic polypeptide do? You know exactly the questions I'm going to, well, not word for word, but you know the questions. I'm going I'm to pick five out of these seven questions. You know all the questions. There's no surprises. You know what I'm going to ask. I'm not going to pull something else out. I gave you the questions. It's just saying, you don't know which five I'm going to ask, but you know all of them that I'm going to ask. The only reason you don't get a hundred is because you're not using, you're not preparing, you're not like looking at this stuff every day. It's the only reason you're getting, if you're worried about your grade, it's because you're not studying enough. You're, I'm in all. If you go back over the class videos, I'm giving you the questions since we've started. I'm giving you all the questions because you haven't prepared yourself. So, and and if we weren't like in this whole COVID thing, you would have to like write these questions down during class, which means you'd have to like pay attention in class. But you guys aren't going back over night you all. Some, some of you, a few of you, I'm going over the material. You know you're not. I know you're not. I wouldn't if it were me. So I know some of you aren't. So I am like you. Or you're, you're, you're trying to do it at the last minute. You're putting on double speed Tuesday night at 2 in the morning, or like Wednesday morning at 2 in the morning. You're on double speed. It's too late. 
You know that doesn't ever work. This is in sociology. So study it today. You know all seven questions. Write it out. Write them out and write the answers. And just study that piece of paper. Get your hand out and pick up something that writes and write some shit down and you'll get a hundred. And it's so nice to have all hundreds because I don't have to touch the paper with my pen. I just look at it, oh, hundred, and then I feel all good inside. And you're going to feel good. So. You have any questions on any of this material? Like any of the, any of the you have any questions on any of the questions I'm going to ask for Wednesday? So, you, so, so last time, O is the yes. universal number, right? Yeah, O negative. Or the O negative. Okay. What's the what's the universal uh, recipient? A B positive. Mm -hmm. Good. I think we're I think we're okay. If you're taking this test online, you I'm strongly urging you to take it Wednesday because it's like it's you see I've got like a lot of rules and I got that stupid proctor thing in there and the whole mirror thing and it's maybe gonna kick you out and Thursday's kind of like too late. I, I left it as I put Thursday as a day on there only because um, sometimes people have trouble on Wednesday evening. So then you have Thursday as a backup. I can help you on Thursday, sort of. Or at least if it doesn't work, if your computer's not cooperating, you can come to Canvas and play it. Like, like there's computers in the library. If you go to the library, you don't need a mirror or anything like that. I know the whole mirror thing is stupid. 